He loves the game, he has fun with it, and he's very good at it. I'm an agent provocateur. Political strategist. Controversial as you can get. An incredible capacity for treachery. Win at all cost mentality. When people think of Washington corruption, they think of Roger Stone. Those who say I have no soul, those who say I have no principles, are losers. Those are bitter losers. There's really nobody quite like Roger Stone. The Nixon tattoo is really all you need to know about Roger. We really pioneered negative campaign advertising. He created the modern sleazeball lobbyist. Washington's been worse for it ever since. Stone's rule, it is better to be infamous than never be famous at all. The swinger scandal happened. My private life is nobody's business. He got chased out of Washington. He's looking to see if he can find an angle. I was like a jockey looking for a horse. You can't win the race if you don't have a horse. saw something that nobody else saw back in the early 80s. I suggested that Trump should explore a bid for the presidency. He created Donald Trump as a political figure. You're the biggest lie, loser. What have I lied about? Have you spoken with the WikiLeaks founder? You're a rape tonight. Roger, you can't just say that. You have to be outrageous to get noticed. America may be collapsing, but Roger Stone is determined to enjoy it. I revel in your hatred, because if I weren't effective, you wouldn't hate me. Thanks so much, everybody. Give it up one more time for these guys. Nice poster. <laughs> it's a great poster. And I got to tell you, I love, I love the film so much, guys. It's, Thank it's you so great. much, Ricky. It's, it's, it's dangerous. It's uh, hard to watch at times, because uh, Roger Stone has become so prominent once again. But God damn it, if Roger Stone isn't a fun guy to watch for two hours, you know? It's like watching an evil villain twist his mustache for two hours. He's very good at it. You know, that's why we wanted to make a movie in part about Roger, because he's a bodybuilding, pot-smoking dandy with a giant tattoo of Richard Nixon between his shoulder blades. He and his wife were exposed as swingers by the National Enquirer. So we thought, if you're going to make a movie about politics, this is somebody that people who hate politics would still be interested in watching a movie about him. He is the definition of a character. He is, he is a character. But you guys, I mean, he says it in the film, you know? He says, these are the liberal, these are the left-wing uh, crooked media following me around. So how did you get Roger Stone? I actually can't imagine it was that hard to get <laughs> Roger Stone to agree to have cameras follow him around, but to let you guys with cameras follow him around. Well, we had read a profile of him in the New Yorker magazine by Jeffrey Tubin. Uh, who was interviewed in our film. And, you know, you can't get more liberal than The New Yorker. And so we just figured, well, maybe he'll let liberal filmmakers make a film about him. It took a little convincing, but, you know, we, we figured the idea is he embraces infamy. Yeah. He loves being the villain, as you say. So, you know, it took a little convincing, but... Did you use that as a, as a, as a way to convince him, or were you like, no, we're going to be objective about it? Or were you like, no, you will be the villain? <laughs> We certainly promised him to be journalistic and to be objective about it. But if Roger's not sparring with someone, if someone's not calling Roger evil, then Roger feels like he failed that day. So <laughs> the idea for him to take on a bunch of liberal filmmakers was much more exciting to him because that's where his rep comes from. If it was a puff piece, who would want to watch it? Did you feel like you were sparring with him at times? I mean, we certainly tried to push Roger uh, to be as open about himself, as transparent. Uh, that's something that doesn't come easily to him. You know, when you ask him some tough questions, he slips into his default mode of just, you know, obfuscation and just trying to, you know, talk about anything other than himself. But we also spent five and a half years with him. We interviewed him over 65 times. We spent hundreds and hundreds of hours with him. So we got to know him very well, and I think we developed a real trust and rapport between us. Now, so you, get to, you got to know Roger really well. When people think about politics, they, think about, they hopefully think about policy. You support the Republicans because you support generally what they stand for. You support the Democrats because hopefully you support generally what they stand for. Does Roger Stone actually stand for any kind of policy, or is he just a guy who loves to battle and the Republicans let him do the most damage when he battles? <clears throat> well, he's a Goldwater conservative, he would say. He's also a libertarian. 
you know, he supports gay marriage and the legalization of marijuana. Um, so there are things he actually believes in that actually sometimes are at odds with the party. But what I think we show in our film is that he, he's not necessarily motivated by an ideology so much as he's motivated by political philosophy. And that's summed up in what he calls Stone's Rules, which are a, a set of maxims he lives his life by. And we also show in the film that that's exactly how Trump operates. Trump does not have an ideology on policy. He has a political philosophy. And that philosophy is to win at all costs. And that is also Stone's philosophy, to win at all costs. Is it fair to call Stone and maybe even Trump kind of anarcho-capitalists to a degree, you know? Um, well, certainly they are willing to do whatever for, uh, in Roger's case, it would be the profit would be getting votes, or I guess in many times also just regular plain old profit. Um, and there was a time where we were interviewing one of Roger's greatest confidants, who's also a producer in the film, and they were discussing a local election over, you know, whose uh, policies you liked, over which person you're supporting, and Roger just said, well, in the end, I'm going to support whoever pays me. <laughs> so uh, in the end, that's in many ways their... Uh, their uh, um, uh, capitalistic view of politics. Did you end up forming a relationship with Roger that where you enjoyed him? Did he kind of seduce you with his charm? Well, I don't think he seduced us with his charm, although he is immensely charming. He's a fantastic rock hunter. He is well-read and thoughtful, and he has incredible uh, scintillating opinions about everything. But we never lost sight of the fact that here is a person who is responsible for many of the most odious things to happen to our country since Watergate. He, we spell out throughout the film how he has played an integral role in the degradation of our country, how he represented murderous third world dictators, how he brought so many terrible people to power. So, you know, you can laugh at Roger's jokes, but that didn't mean that we were ever seduced by his charms. How does he sleep at night when, does he view any of that odiousness as odious? Roger says in the film, if you hate me, <clears throat> if you loathe me, then I did my job right. Um, we've uh, tried to ask them, you know, have you ever, do you ever feel maybe any regret of obfuscating to get Trump as president? He's, what are you talking about? We saved America. At one point on election day, we were with Alex Jones and Roger Stone as they were toasting each other to their victory. And Alex Jones said that people who the media call liberals those are really anti-American people. They're the real liberals. Roger is the real liberal. Alex Jones is the real liberal. Why? That's how they see themselves. Because they're the ones standing up for the little guy. They're the ones standing up for the truth against the big bad government, the big bad, the man who is against them. And they've managed to very successfully rewrite Donald Trump's position, as many people would call him, the establishment, the swamp, to be the outsider. And that's very much what our movie shows, is how they plucked things from the past, like the Nixon campaign, the Reagan campaign, and rejiggered them to fit Donald Trump, and in many ways flip his image to appeal to those people. Well, one of the things that I think you also show is that there is, no, there is nothing more establishment than Roger Stone. Can you talk about that? Right. I mean, the idea that Donald Trump is going to drain the swamp is absolutely ludicrous because the two people that he surrounded himself uh, most intimately with, Roger Stone and Paul Manafort, were literally the people who created the swamp in D.C. They were the first mega lobbying firm, Black Manafort and Stone. They crossed the unwritten rule on K Street in D.C. that you shouldn't elect people and then turn around and profit by lobbying them. And they really, uh, you know, so brought about the decline in the culture and Washington, that's exactly what they're talking about when you hear drain the swamp. And now Roger wrings his hands about it and he said, oh, I know because I, I was once a part of this system that was so corrupt. That's how I know that it's bad. He's still but a part of this system that's corrupt. Absolutely. It's, it's complete hypocrisy. Um, but he, he knows it's he hypocrisy. He does, but he doesn't think it's hypocritical because whatever he thinks uh, he does is right. So that's just it. There is just a, essentially some sort of blocker that he's put up where he'll never be able to confront himself. Roger, we have filmed him saying, um, if anyone doesn't agree with your story about politics, they just call you a crazy conspiracy theorist. And we didn't even hit cut on the camera between when we walked to the next spot where he was dismissing somebody's ideas because he was a crazy conspiracy theorist. <laughs> and I... 
it, you can point it out to him and he'll say, oh no, I researched it and I'm right and here's my facts and this guy's a nut and he's just a, a, a BS artist trying to tear us down because he, he's jealous of us. As he said from Alex Jones's studio, right? Like, <laughs> uh, you interview Donald Trump in the film a lot. I mean, you have a, a very, what seems like a very long interview with Donald Trump that you got. Obviously, this was during the campaign before he was president. As we've seen since he's become president, he's a fucking disaster in every interview that he gives. <laughs> How was it for you guys interviewing him? And also, let me thankfully, he's a fucking disaster in every interview he gives. It's just wonderful. It's a gift every time. <laughs> well, you know, he was totally nice and fine. And, you know, we're thankful to him that he g gave us an interview. Um, there was some moments where we were scratching our head. I don't it, he was yelling at someone in the other room that wasn't there. There was nobody in the other room after he flubbed the line. Um, but <laughs> besides that, um, you know, he was, he was totally nice. We didn't shake his hand because at that point, uh, we're like, we heard he's a germaphobe, so he obviously got over that. Though. I was the only one that got to touch him because I mic'd him up. <laughs> you didn't get to see the hands then, that's what you're saying. Uh, although after, after the interview, um, he called up Roger and he said, uh, you should be careful of these guys. I don't think they have your best interest at, at heart. So, you know, he certainly felt that so our no questions were a little bit too penetrating. They weren't softballs enough for him. So nobody had done their homework on you before sitting you down to interview a presidential candidate who had a likely shot at winning the election. And Roger Stone hadn't said anything to him. He learned in the interview that he had assigned a sheet for beforehand that you may not be diehard Republicans. Well, this was, this was still the You're era where idiot. really Sorry. anybody could have gotten an interview with Trump. I mean, I think that some school newspapers were interviewing him. In so, the line behind uh, you. Yeah, right. I mean, it was, I can't say that it was because, you know, we were such respected journalists that he decided to sit down with us. We just had a camera and it was pointed at him. And one thing we learned about Trump <clears throat> with Roger is that even in his largest big uh, uh, business operations, he's still a very shoestring operation kind of person. He has a very, very small number of people that he turns to, that he trusts. He often fires them, and then a few years later rehires them because he doesn't really have anyone else that he trusts as much or who proven their loyalty to go to. So Comey will be coming back is what you're saying? <laughs> uh, Comey ain't coming back, but so someone like uh, Steve Bannon, who right now is not fired yet, but he easily could be fired or brought back in. That's the way Trump operates in many ways. And when we interviewed Donald Trump, one of the questions he didn't like was that we asked him about one of his public feuds with Roger, where they were in, on TV calling each other losers. And uh, that is the kind of relationship he's had with Roger and with a lot of the people in his inner circle. It's a very intensely love-hate relationship. Is it a love-hate relationship? It seems to me that when they're in the public eye calling each other losers, maybe not for Stone, but especially right now, it's for the, their best interest in that moment. It's in because of the Russia investigation and because of how Roger Stone looks to a, a mainstream president, a mainstream president, not even a campaign anymore. It's it's in that person's president's best interest to not have Roger Stone at the forefront. So they have to call him a loser, essentially, right? Well, you know, um, the president is a colossal egotist, and certainly Roger, uh, in any other standing next to anybody else, would be uh, the biggest narcissist in the room. Um, and so, you know, explore this in the film. Excuse me, like uh, what it feels like to be uh, the person who finds the candidate that then gets all the credit for the work that the strategist does. Right. It's uh, so you know they've butted heads many times over you know their the the feuding of their egos. I do think that's legitimate. Roger's first wife told us that you know they've been married and divorced so many times that she can't even keep. Track Track of it. That's really the dynamic in their relationship. It is truly a, a familial one. You know, Roger has been Trump's chief political advisor for over three decades. They've known each other since the early 80s. I mean, and, and as Dylan was saying, they have su Trump has such a small orbit of people, so few people that he trusts. That's why Roger will always be a part of his life. Roger is undyingly loyal to Trump. He knows that, uh, you know, we, we met many people who uh, know the president, but Roger and Paul Manafort were the only people who felt at, at liberty to call him Donald as opposed to Mr. Trump, which is actually what Trump expected you to call him prior to uh, his election. Now, of course, it's Mr. President. How um, long had Paul Manafort known uh, Mr. President? I, I mean, they had represented him since the 80s. 
uh, and that Black Manafort and Stone was his lobbying firm um, when he, at the height of his casino years. Because he tries to paint them as sort of fringe consultants who had very little to do with them, and like Manafort was brought into the fold by someone he didn't even know, and he got rid of them very quickly. But that's not the case at all. It's, it's definitely not the case. Um, <clears throat> When Manafort was fired, you know, it was because these stories started to come out about his connections to Russia. Um, but he was still advising Trump, according to reports. I mean, uh, I, I believe it was Bloomberg who reported right after the election that it was Manafort's strategy to actually focus on, focus on Michigan, which obviously was a, a huge part of their, their victory. So I think now it's advantageous to distance for the president to distance himself for anyone who might be involved in, uh, you know, alleged collusion with Russia or Russia at all, although he still has many people in his inner circle with some, some questions around their relationships to Russia. Yeah, what was it like talking to Paul Manafort? Because Roger Stone looks funny and charming to me. Manafort looks like a really mean son of a bitch that could possibly order a hit. Like, I, I, mean, I don't know if he's ever done that. I'm not going to say he has, but he strikes me as someone that is born from the bowels of hell. Manafort has, in many ways, just as interesting story as Roger Stone. When the Berlin Wall fell, he and Roger and a bunch of other their acolytes went over to the new burgeoning democracy and sold their wares over there, and in many ways helped shape the democracy in the Ukraine, especially for them, but also in Russia for many of their people. Um, and so Paul Manafort really made a business, uh, along with Black Manafort and Stone, but he's the one that really took the lead on it, of going around and uh, finding people around the world. They, they called it the torturers lobby, which uh, Roger was intricately involved with, questionable dictators who uh, officially America supported because they were anti-communist. And back in the Reagan era, uh, anybody who was even vaguely anti-communist got the rubber stamp. And they uh, lobbied for them in America and helped make their case and helped them get resources from America to continue their uh, regimes. And so uh, a lot of these ties originated from that era but it was really Paul Manafort who stayed with it and was in many ways the guy behind the leader, uh, the president of the Ukraine, right before Crimea, uh, the war happened, or before Ukraine fell and the Crimean War happened. You know, Ricky, one of the things that we personally learned from the making of this movie as liberal filmmakers is we spent an enormous amount of time with Roger Stone, with Paul Manafort, Alex Jones, even James O'Keefe, who makes those hidden videos that have destroyed so many people on the left. And it was an enormously eye-opening experience for us because usually people on the opposite side of the spectrum from us politically, we want to think of them as devils. We want to think of them as just odious people that you're in the room with them. And as many people have commented on Twitter after watching our movie, that you want to take a shower after being with them. That has not been our experience. In fact, a lot of these people are perfectly likable. You can have an absolutely you know, uh, genteel conversation with them. And because we were not confronting them, but we were just asking them questions at a distance and having, at least on the surface, an amicable interaction with them. It was very enlightening, right? We are at such a, a polarized, divisive point in our nation, and we have gotten to a point where we can't understand how the other half live. We can't understand why people would have voted for Trump or, or how these decisions could have been made. That was something that was very illuminating for us because I think over the course of this movie, we could see perfectly how this could happen and how the people who disagreed with us were not demonic. They were just wrong. They're just wrong. But sure, <laughs> I, when we talk about how they could vote for them, I think what gets lost in that conversation is that these people are actually representing the best interests of those that are not the elite that voted for them. You know, the working class, if you will, which always gets painted as those that voted for Trump, even though I think it's actually not true demographically that they, for the most part, went for Trump. What is interesting to me is that they don't represent their best interests. They represent the torture lobby. They represent dark money into politics. They represent big corporations. Some of them represent child, like bringing back, ruining child labor laws. You know, they don't represent the best interests of this country, but they are somehow able to spin it and con everybody that, that they are. That's what makes them born from the bowels of hell for me, excuse me. I'm sure they're very amicable when you talk to them, but it's, it's, it's that sort of spin and lies that, sorry, go ahead. Well, I think what Morgan's saying is, you know, we are so polarized so we could all use a little dialogue with each other. And if we don't do that, we're just gonna be further polarized. And 
we, we're seeing right now what that means for our country. But what you're saying, it goes back to this idea. It's like, you know, it's the what's the matter with Kansas argument. It's well documented that uh, Republicans over the years appeal to large demographics who ultimately their policies end up hurting disproportionately than anyone else. Um, so I think that's why, that's where dialogue comes in. It's like if we could really have uh, substantive talks about these things, maybe people could understand them better. But also what our film kind of shows is that Roger created these conditions. Like his career has, has been all about kind of stripping away these defenses that maybe we once had against, you know, uh, what one would call like a demagogue like Trump or, you know, just these people who, who are, as I'm sure you would say, just liars from hell, you know? So I was exaggerating a little bit with the bowels of hell thing, yeah. guys. Yeah, but, you know, and I think we have to differentiate between voters and the people who perpetrate what, are, what you're talking about, right? And, you know, Jane Mayer uh, from The New Yorker says in our movie that there's no, there's no grassroots movement to gut the EPA, to destroy environmental regulations in this country. These are people who are operatives who are working on the behest of the fossil fuel industry, right? That's not, there's no person in Kansas, uh, well, I mean, who maybe who outside of who works in the fossil fuel industry, who is you know wanting the, to see the the destruction of our environment, and so certainly Roger is one of those people who has perpetrated um, the degradation of our country on a large scale. What I was talking about more was that just regular people that we we need to have more of an understanding of each other in this country and a more constructive dialogue. And you know I hope that. You know, we've always felt that this was, we never wanted to make a movie where we were just preaching to the choir and it's like some finger wagging liberal polemic. We didn't think that there was any point to making that movie. We wanted to make a movie that Trump supporters, that, that Democrats, that conservatives could all learn from and enjoy so that we could actually make a constructive contribution to the dialogue. And I, I think you do that. Sorry, I don't mean to interrupt you. I think you do that by finding, having the character be Roger Stone. You know, you have a, a Wolf of Wall Street kind of situation here where you have a group of people doing a really horrendous thing that America allows, but you have an incredibly charismatic, hilarious figure at, at the front of it. That's one of the things that drew us to Roger to begin with, is that many of the backroom dealers are people like Carl Rove, or you mentioned Paul Manafort before. Not he's charismatic at all, Carl Rove. But, you know, uh, he's not exactly wearing a $10,000 suit and smoking a cigar and commanding all the attention because he doesn't want to. Most backroom dealers, if you say, well, did you do that dirty trick? Did you make that deal? The response is, no, I didn't do it. He did it over there. You're the dirty trickster. Roger's the guy who goes, this thing, okay, it is. I destroyed you. And so that was just a much more compelling character to tell the story with. Now, you talk about uh, Roger and, and, and Manafort, you know, being some of the people responsible for kind of destroying a lot of the fences that we had up in this country. When we talk about the fences, we're talking about ethics, uh, essentially. And we're reaching a point right now, specifically this week, where the president fired the director of the FBI, right? He's now tweeting that he may have taped conversations with the director of the FBI inside the White House. We're not even talking about ethics anymore. We're talking about legality. And we have a Republican-controlled House and Senate that seemingly don't want to do fuck all about it. So is it not Roger Stone that's destroying these fences anymore? Are these fences just gone for good? And the Republican Party itself, the GOP establishment, also doesn't believe in these fences, i.e. ethics? And you know, legalities. I, I think that one of the things that we really demonstrate in our film is that it's one thing to have this 29-year-old, 29-year-old uh, uh, year-long dream to elect Donald Trump the presidency, uh, the president. But what what Roger was so successful in doing by creating the first super PAC in the eight, in the 70s, by creating the first mega lobbying firm in the 80s, was to pull down the safeguards that would have, in any other era, made it impossible for a Donald Trump to be elected president. You know, Roger is so cognizant of how to use social media. He's a genius on Twitter, even though he says the most horrible things that you could possibly say. He has an extraordinary following. Uh, we were there at the 50th anniversary of the Kennedy assassination when Roger first met Alex Jones, and he zeroed in on him. Wow, this is a guy who is speaking to millions of Americans who are off the radar, who will buy my books, who will believe my bullshit, who will become like my minions, right? And so, you know, those safeguards 
Roger has very uh, has played such an incredible role in tearing them down. And I do think that you know this week that we've heard so many comparisons with Watergate, but what happened during Watergate was that the Republicans and the Democrats came together and they said, this is a bridge too far. You know, we can't just have a corrupt nation. We need to band together and investigate the president. It doesn't seem like we have that environment anymore. That, you know, I, I am not confident that there will be an independent investigation of the president because it has to be signed off on by at least some of someone in the power structure of the Republican Party. And there seems to be absolutely no will for that to occur. There is no bridge too far when uh, your entire uh, career has been paid for by people like the fossil fuel industry who are de dedicated to tax cuts and destroying the EPA, essentially, right? I mean, that's what it seems like it is. They have an agenda that if they take down Donald Trump, they're in fear that their agenda will be just gone. There's also the element of winning. You know, the, the Republicans in Congress, I, I mean, I've, I've interviewed many members of Congress over the years, and the number one concern for members of Congress is holding their seats, right? If there is a horrible scandal that destroys the Trump presidency, and they all have to eat crow that they got behind this guy, even though they never wanted him, but then they stood in lockstep with him, and he's destroyed there will be a wave election that will sweep the Republicans out of both houses of Congress. That is the absolute last thing that they want to occur. So the desire to hold power is paramount of importance to them. And I think that is more so than, that, than any other reason uh, why they are so reluctant to have an independent investigation of the president. Well, let's hope that sweep happens, uh, whether they get a special investigator or not. Let's take some questions from these guys. Who's got questions out there? Hi, hi, thank you for being here. Um, so I'm gonna go back to kind of something you said early in the, in the uh, interview about this mindset, the ideology that they're kind of obsessed with of winning at all cost and like what a toxic idea that is. Um, I'm just kind of wondering from your perspective as filmmakers, what kind of, um, what kind of insight did you get on that, you know, personally getting to know people like Donald Trump and, and um, you know, Stone, uh, about what kind of upbringing or education or lack thereof that would have led to that? <clears throat> oh, uh, it's a good question, and people ask us that actually a lot. I think there's a tendency to just assume that a person like Roger Stone must have been molested as a child by, by a liberal. Yeah, by a liberal or like some some bully JFK supporter beat him up at school every day, or his father was a, a you know liberal who beat him every night or something, but it's actually, to the contrary, he had like a completely normal pedestrian, middle class upbringing. He, he just was obsessed with politics. When he was 12 years old, he read Barry Goldwater's book and just decided that that's what he wanted to do with his life. And he was electing adult candidates in Connecticut and New York to uh, office, and they were calling him for advice when he was still a teenager before he was even in college. And then we, when he was in college, he would be advising candidates from his dorm room, and he was identified as a political prodigy, and that's why he left school to work for the Nixon campaign when he was only 19 years old. So, um, and then, of course, he was the youngest person called to the Watergate grand jury. So. <laughs> which, which is a point of pride for him. Yeah, oh, yes, his parents called them, and they were mortified, but he thought it was cool. Yeah. Uh, a silly question, or not silly, I probably should have asked it before. What does Roger Stone think of the film? Um, you know, there are parts of it that he says that he doesn't like, but overall, uh, he said it was a masterpiece. Uh, and <laughs> because it's starring Roger Stone. I'm not laughing because you know, it's not good. It is no, a great film. Well, he, it's, he, was, he said the, the lead character in the movie is incredibly handsome, and we spelled his name right everywhere. So, you know, that, <laughs> that, that, is, that was a pretty low bar that we had to reach. Um, but, you know, he, he was only too happy. He's only too happy to talk about the movie in his gazillion interviews every day. And we hope that he keeps talking about it. And we hope Trump tweets about it. Some of the things that to many people would indict Roger the hardest are Roger's own lines. Uh, when we asked Roger about the torturers lobby, about you know the dictators who I mentioned before, who many people at the time even found questionable, but he represented and took their money and got them more resources from America, his response is, I'm proud of it because I made a lot of money. And to Roger, that's a perfect explanation. And to many liberals, that's the worst possible indictment you could have of Roger. So it, it, it reflects in many ways the two uh, sides of American politics and how two different people can look at the same thing in such a different way. 
Well, it reflects also a villainous character and how you present them as well. It, it's the same thing with Gordon Gecko and in Wall Street or Leonardo DiCaprio and Wolf of Wall Street. We have villains throughout history and cinema that people look at as villains and other people start dressing like and think are heroes. You know? uh, the big line from Gordon Gecko is greed is good. With Roger, it's hate is a more powerful motivator than love. That's uh, how Roger operates. That's his very Nixonian method. It's sure you can be inspired to go out to vote because you love somebody, but you'll get out there with a fire in your ass if you hate the other person. And that was what Roger really did in this last election. It wasn't Trump's great, Trump's gonna save America for his personal part, it was Hillary Clinton and Bill Clinton are rapists. They'll kill your pet if you come out against them. Which he actually said that, which is... <laughs> I didn't make that up, yes. Yeah. <laughs> and it's, uh, it's worth mentioning that uh, Rogers Taylor, who makes all of Suits, Alan Flusser, also one of Trump's tailors, was, uh, he worked on one film in his career, and that was to design all the suits for Wall Street. <laughs> really? <laughs> I have to ask, uh, before we go to the audience for more questions, what was it like uh, hanging out with Alex Jones? Um, wow. Uh, Alex Jones is, uh, he is a person of extraordinary excess. You know, there is nothing that, Roger, that Alex Jones doesn't do that is uh, a 15 on a scale of 1 to 10. Did he take um, off his shirt for you? No, I, unfortunately he didn't. You know, he has such an extraordinary physique. We would have loved that. Um, you know, he, he, is, um, he is truly a larger than life, just fascinating character. He is one of the most talented broadcasters that you can imagine. I mean, he's, he's absolutely riveting. I mean, absolutely he can riveting. talk about nothing for six hours at a time and you will just be lost in that hypnotic trance of, of whatever he's saying, you know, whatever he's saying. And so, um, you know, Alex Jones is, is another just incredible character to follow. Um, it was an eye-opening experience for us to spend so much time with him. And what was also just fascinating about Roger is that he understood that Alex Jones was someone special. Alex Jones doesn't have listeners or viewers. He has followers. He commands legions, millions of Americans look to him as their, as their spiritual leader. And those were the people who came out of the woodwork that voted on election day that weren't in Hillary Clinton's modeling of, of how she was going to win. That, I think a lot of those people were the, diff the differences in some of those battleground states. And we asked Roger on election day, how come you're not at the Hilton with Donald Trump you know, for his big party? He said, what am I going to do? Just like hang out with a bunch of people I don't know? He's like, no, I'm going to drive millions of people to the polls by spending all day on Infowars with Alex Jones. And that was a very deliberate strategy on Roger's behalf to win the presidency for Trump. And you asked the, what the experience was like being with them and with Alex Jones. Uh, we were filming with Alex uh, and Roger on actual election day. And right when they were in their glory toasting with champagne, I was right next to Alex's main camera with our own camera. And he, when he went into some of his really most intense speech, would shift his gaze from his camera right to me. And we'd be locked eyes. And he would be saying things like, and we had to take the liberals and bash their brains out. We didn't want to, but it was for their own good. And he would go into that. And then he would shift right into his infomercial type ads for his protein powders and his eyes would go right back to the lens and he'd go right back into it. So this leads me to ask, and it's the same thing that I would imagine you were looking for with Roger. You know that Roger, or you feel at least that Roger and Alex Jones are people who are selling something. For the most part, they are selling something. So there has to be an element of being full of it at times. And you're looking to hopefully catch that moment when you're asking them questions. Not necessarily a gotcha question, if you're whatever, whoever uses that phrase, but you know, or catch them off guard. But did you ever find a moment where Alex Jones or Roger Stone had a moment of self-reflection or you felt like you caught them in a moment where they, they too realized that they were full of shit? I don't think, uh, although they're birds of a feather, I think there's a lot of differences between Roger Stone and Alex Jones. Um, and I don't think any of us will pretend to know what's in Alex Jones's head. Uh, we do have some insight on, on Roger. You know, he, he says pretty openly, you know, he's like, don't confuse Roger Stone with the Stephen Colbert, Roger Stone character that I play on television. And we've, we've come to find that he just basically plays an exaggerated version of himself. Um, certainly, he likes to make money. He writes books about various conspiracies, uh, Lyndon Johnson killed JFK, etc. That's kind of where he meets with Alex Jones and they get along so, so well. 
Um, but Roger does want to win. His dream was to elect Donald Trump president. But at the same time, I guess, yes, he says, Alex Jones, the Info Warriors, they are Trump's people. people. They're skeptical about the government. Um, and they vote. But they also buy books. You know, and Roger Stone's also a human being. That's one of the reasons why we want to show him with his family, with his wife. I mean, I think those are the times that he really does let down his guard. There's a wonderful exchange that he has with his wife uh, when they're driving a car at the RNC convention. That there are intimate moments. You know, Roger, we have seen him consistently be a good friend, a good mentor, a good family member. His his daughter loves him. His granddaughter loves him. And he's and, good to you guys, too. I mean, I, I don't mean that as an I, indictment at all. I mean, like, he's genuinely, you've made this film out, it was very critical, and... Well, he's... he did threaten to kill us many times if, <laughs> if he didn't like how the movie turned out. In fact, that he was really arguing that after the credits rolled, there should be a montage of all the times he threatened to kill us. And he brought that back up yesterday, so he's really firm on that point. So I said, you know, we have to revisit that with Netflix. How sincere did you ever feel he was in that threat? Um... I, I, so we certainly didn't take it lightly, right? <laughs> you know, <laughs> it wasn't like, ha ha, I'm gonna kill you. It was like, no, I'm gonna kill you if I don't like how this movie turns out. As um, uh, one of his uh, former uh, um, acolytes, um, uh, one of the former governor of New Jersey said, uh, Roger's a good friend, he's not a good enemy. If Roger decides to destroy you, you might find posters of yourself being called a child molester in your neighborhood. You might find uh, back taxes that you haven't paid yet being alerted to the IRS. And you might find another whole host of things being done against you. So we, we certainly joked about whether or not Roger, Roger would kill us. Uh, I doubt that would have happened, but if Roger really hated it, he has a very large arsenal of uh, uh, weapons to pull that he will mercilessly pull on his enemies. And that's part of what got him where he is today. He's the ultimate dirty trickster. <laughs> uh, next question. Hey, guys. Uh, so getting to film this documentary, has it given you a better insight of what um, people like Roger Stone does, like, you know, behind the scenes? Well, absolutely. One of the things we learned is that political consultants don't sit around waiting for the phone to ring. They find a candidate and they lock onto them and they say, you're great, you're amazing, you can be governor, you can be senator, Mr. Trump, you can be president, and here's how. And uh, as Roger says in our film, he was a jockey looking for a horse and he saw Trump as a prime piece of political horse flesh. Um, and so um, finding that person and cultivating them is one of the main uh, goals of any political operative. One of the things that we didn't talk about, uh, excuse me for not bringing this up, but w what this film demonstrates is that this recent election really does, not just because Ro Roger is friends with Donald, but the tactics of this recent election have Roger Stone's sort of blueprint hands all over it. Can you talk about that a little bit? Sure, sure. So... Many people want to kind of identify, like, who's the mastermind behind Trump, right? And we agree, and I think a lot of people close to Trump agree that that, that person doesn't exist besides Trump himself. Trump created Trump. Trump is the main reason that he is the president. But what our film demonstrates is that if there's someone second to that, it is most definitely Roger Stone. Because as Morgan was saying before, he's been his political advisor since the early 80s. And he created this philosophy that made Trump into a politician. It's the philosophy that Stone created and Trump followed. And now he brought it, brought it all the way to the White House. Yeah, I guess I, I meant that more in terms of disinformation, in terms of sort of like any anybody talking about you, as long as people are talking about you, almost whether it's good or bad. A, a, a lot of the tactics that we really saw the Trump campaign employ, not even just the sort of silent majority spin that we saw that clearly came from the Nixon era, but a lot of the other tactics that Stone used. Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean... Stone's rules really do articulate the political philosophy and all the tactics that both the Trump campaign and now the Trump presidency uh, incarnate, right? So one of them is admit nothing, deny everything, launch counterattack, right? That's every, what Trump does every single time he's accused of something. Another one is attack, 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 never defend. Also, we've just, you can, that's rolled out chapter and verse by, by Trump. Um, you know, it's, the hate is a more powerful motivator than love. These are the things that, that Roger 
is, is driven by. These are what he lives by. And this is what he has infused into Trump world. And so there's a reason that this was the dirtiest campaign in American history, arguably, is because the, the tactics that Roger has employed so effectively have been mainstreamed. And it's also important to realize that the Democrats, everybody employs these tactics, right? They've become part and parcel of our politics. That's one of the reasons why we've gotten to such a low point. The difference is that there isn't anybody out front on the Democratic side who's willing to take accountability for it and who has been so consistently effective like Roger Stone is. There isn't some Roger Stone of the Democratic Party. Um, and I think a lot of Democrats wish there were. Right, because then there might have been a lot of different outcomes in elections. Um, but certainly, the the dirtiness of our politics that is something that has been Roger's brand, and it's something that he has branded the nation with. One more question, sorry, before we go to the audience again. I'm very selfish. Uh, you say that you know this. Roger Stone runs campaigns. He doesn't run presidencies. The presidency right now, or this administration, seems to still be operating off of Stone's rules, right? Stone's rules or Stone's laws? Excuse Stone's me. rules. Stone's rules. Are we seeing the ineffectiveness of Stone, Stone's rules when it comes to governing at the moment? Well, we asked Roger if he wanted a position in the Trump uh, presidency, and he said he's not interested in politics. He's only interested in campaigning. Um, and so from Roger's philosophy, it's still all just about win, win, win. I mean, he has his certain things that he definitely believes in very strongly, such as legalization of marijuana and other social, uh, socially liberal things like that. But, but his, um, Trump's administration doesn't, ne doesn't necessarily believe in that. I mean, Sessions is the head of DOJ. He doesn't well, it, exactly. And as we've seen from our politics, it's really just formed into two teams. And Roger originally really was a full believer. He calls it his Nazi Hitler youth when he was the uh, Goldwater boy. And he believed, you know, hippies should be killed and the Vietnam War was a great idea and anyone who did drugs should be in, uh, in jail forever. And he really changed over time, but he never switched teams. So any individual beliefs that he has that go against the overall team, he'll criticize them because he's the outsider who can, but he'll still go out there and he'll do that propaganda and he'll hit that person to get his team up there. The details afterwards, he'll sit back on the sidelines and criticize and make himself look good. Yeah, I mean, the problem is that governance is very boring, right? You know, doing the things that it takes to um, really make sure that policies are implemented. I mean, look, Trump doesn't want to read his bills. He's not interested in the minutiae of the policies that he's trying to put forward. He's only interested in scoring victories. And so that is that can actually be a great uh, strategy for governance. Uh, I think the governor of New York, Andrew Cuomo, is very much allied with that idea. It's like he just wants to come out with victories. It's a little bit less the details are less important to him. Uh, so I don't think that's a disqualifier. But Roger is not very interested in governing. Trump clearly is not very interested in governing. He was interested in being the president of the United States. And, you know, Trump mind-bogglingly has said a number of times, like, he was surprised how hard the job was, right? Because he never thought about the governance side. And um, I do think that where if Roger had been uh, the president, that because he's a little bit more conventional and he's been a, a Washington insider, that he would be doing a better job on the governing side, in particular by surrounding himself with really smart policy people who knew how to do the job. But because Trump is so distrustful of people and above all, his, his, he wants to see loyalty from his staff, he has to have a very small nucleus. And that's why he hasn't put in, in all the agencies, the top people, you know, because he wants everybody to be under his control. And that has been a poor strategy so far for governance. Yeah. One more question from the audience. Who has hi. the... Oh, hi. Over here. Um, I was just wondering what advice you would have um, to filmmakers who want to make a documentary? <laughs> well, when we started this five and a half years ago, it was brought up to us by a very experienced documentarian that this was the kind of subject that maybe you should really sink your teeth into and film for something like five years. And the three of us all rolled our eyes and said, oh my God, I'd quit right now if I knew I had to film it for five years. And five and a half years later, it rolled into the biggest story in the world. And it ended up being a completely different movie than we started making. And so my advice would be to find a subject that compels you that makes you interested enough to get up every day and film them, that is a, a, a subject that's passionate enough for you to stick with it when nobody else cares and nobody else is interested. For many years, people would say to us, oh, it's a political documentary. 
who's going to be interested in that? Who cares? And then before we knew it, we were at the center of the story everyone is entranced with. And so it was only because of our passion and because of our excitement about it that led us to go for such a long marathon. And, and this is a, a golden era for uh, independent filmmaking because filmmaking has become so inexpensive with the advances in digital technology. You can really make your own damn movie, as our buddy Lloyd Kaufman says, and you can go out, whether it's a, a narrative film or a documentary film, and, and you can make it happen with your own smarts. And what's so amazing about a platform like Netflix is that there is just an extraordinary appetite for great content. And so there are people who are looking for projects like ours, like maybe the one that you have in mind, that can create the platform where they can show it to 92 million people around the world like Netflix will. And so it is, it is a really gratifying time to be a filmmaker, but it is all predicated upon your initiative. And so don't wait for somebody to grab your script and like, oh, you know, all of a sudden I'm gonna, Will Smith is gonna be in my movie. It really has to be done with, um, you know, grit and determination and, and you just have to go out and do it. And the reason why we're in this, unconventional situation of us having three directors is because for the first four years of this movie, it was literally just the three of us making the movie. Um, you know, Dylan and Dan doing the, the camera and the sound and me asking the questions and, and largely doing the production, si the producing side of it. But we were never undaunted. We were never daunted by that because we believe so strongly in the subject. I mean, it takes a team to make to to make a movie, especially something like this. Do you guys have any interest in continuing to follow Roger as specifically the Russia investigations continue to heat up and it's possible that he's affiliated with it, even though I know he denies it completely. But is there a possibility for a get me Roger Stone part two or, you know, Roger Stone goes to jail? Tell Netflix. Can he be like the new <laughs> Ernest? Can he be like the Ernest of political documentaries? Uh, we, we had to in many ways just cut off when we finished making the film because it's endless. Roger is absolutely endless. Uh, we could have made a 10 hour miniseries. Uh, we didn't even get into his shenanigans in local elections and the sheriff elections and his casino lobbying. I mean, you wanna get seedy and sleazy. Let's, uh, let's get into some casino lobbying stories. Um, so uh, it absolutely is something which uh, could just go on and on and on. And Roger says, uh, even to us, you ain't seen nothing yet. So he'd be willing? Um, yeah, I think so. I mean, I think Roger is um, is really content with how this turned out. Um, Roger is only 64 years old, which means that he has decades of deviousness ahead of him. Um, you know, if Netflix wants to greenlight a sequel, we are totally on board to do it. Uh, I think that his story is extraordinary, but I think that first we want as many people as possible to watch this movie because I think that it is it's a really imp it's really important to understand how we got here as a nation. And I, I hope that our film really does spell that out because if we don't understand how Roger Stone has been so effective all these years, he is gonna continue to manipulate us and to move the country in the direction that he wants it to go as opposed to where the, the liberal people in this room want it to go. Or the, where the people want it to go and need it to go for like the greater benefit of all rather than Stone and his rich acolytes. <laughs> Roger Stone would call you a liberal globalist who's trying to destroy America with a comment like that. I, 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 I will take on that with, with pride. Just don't call me a cuck at the end, Roger. Uh, guys, congratulations on the film. It's so wonderful. It's on Netflix today, right? People yes. can go watch it. If it's you today. have TV, if you have Netflix, watch this movie. It's incredibly important and very entertaining. Congratulations. Yeah, and if you guys. like it, so tweet much. about it. Spread the word. <laughs> Roger Stone, too. Thank, Thank you so much. much.